Okay, so we'll continue with this slide five in PowerPoint number two. So let's clear up a couple of things. And these are, are things that, you know, are kind of like urban legends that people talk about because, you know, death is scary and taboo. But here are some things that don't happen after we die. Okay, first of all, hair and nails do not grow after death. Okay, when someone dies, basically their cells stop dividing. It's not gonna happen. You know, I remember when I was in grade school, people would tell, you know, scary stories at slumber parties and it would be like, oh yeah, they opened up the casket and the person had really long fingernails and there were marks where they were scratching on the lid. You know, no, no. And as a person who has had to collect DNA samples from people who have been exhumed, meaning that they have been buried for a long time, I think the longest person I had to collect a sample from was buried seven years, does not happen, okay? Does not happen. So the reason people think this is because since all of our cells aren't working anymore, we're also not gonna intake, have an intake of water and we're gonna become dehydrated. So bodies become dehydrated. And when that happens, you'll see the cuticles of the nails contract um, and you know any like skin surface can potentially shrink up a little bit and contract. And so the nails may appear longer because the tissues are simply drying out, okay? And the same thing can happen with the scalp. So I think that that's where that comes from probably, but you know, no, don't believe any of the, the nonsense things about, you know, someone, they opened up a casket and the person had really long hair, you know, no. If that's the case and they had really long hair when they died as well. Okay, so our cells are gonna slowly start to die. So. You know, as a person who was trained as a molecular and cell biologist, I tend to look at death a little differently. Um, can a person die instantly? For example, in a car crash or in a fall from a, you know, a very significant height or in a plane crash? Absolutely, okay? If you define death as that person's, you know, receives a traumatic brain injury to the point where they're no longer going to be able to live on their own and be the person that you knew when they were alive. Yes, absolutely a person can die instantly, okay? When you look at it as a cell biologist, cells actually keep functioning after death for you know a little while, okay? Think of like the example of a chicken with its head cut off. You probably heard about that, how the chicken can still run around, but obviously, if, if a chicken has been decapitated, they're not alive, okay? So yes, there are certain reflexes that happen um, in the body after death and the cells don't immediately lose their contents. So they start to, um, you know, slowly run out of things that they would normally need to survive. And Okay, the big thing that drives this process is your cells starting to have their stores of the molecule ATP depleted. Okay, so those of you, I have to ask you to, you know, draw back to maybe another basic biology class that you took. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize that. If I put it on a quiz or an exam, it's just gonna say ATP. And ATP is, you can think of it as money for the cell, okay? So every time the cell needs to make a protein or they need to synthesize a carbohydrate, the cell has to fork over ATP to do that, okay? So ATP is made in the mitochondria, you know, the old phrase, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Yeah, that's because it's the place where ATP is made, okay? But eventually, when a person dies, the mitochondria are gonna stop working and slowly the ATP reserves are going to be depleted, okay? And that is what is going to drive this first process of rigor mortis that we're gonna talk about. So, you know, I, I'm showing you this photograph. This is like the simplest version of the muscle contraction cycle that I could find on the Google, um, but I'm not gonna put this photograph on an exam and say, label these parts, okay? I just wanna show this to you. So 
in your muscles, okay, and this can be in your voluntary muscles of your legs and your arms, but also in any all of your involuntary muscles, you have two different types of fibers, okay? You have, these are called actin, these are myosin, and then you have these big kind of long things right here. These are referred to as myosin heads. And your muscles contract because the myosin heads attach to the actin fibers, and then it requires ATP to break them apart, so then the myosin can contract further and it can attach to another part farther up on the actin, okay? So when muscles contract, it requires ATP, and it's basically these actin-myosin bridges being broken, and then they can move farther along, um, and that's how muscles contract, okay? So it constantly requires ATP to break these apart so that the muscle can contract, and once the cells are out of ATP, whatever position these ended up in, in terms of the myosin attached to the actin and whatever position those muscles were in when they were contracting, that's the position it's going to stay in, okay? And that's what drives the process of rigor mortis, okay? So rigor mortis refers to the stiffening of the muscles after death and it's always going to start in the smallest muscles of the body, okay? These are called erector pili muscles, and I know that you've had them contract, um, and you know what they are, okay? They are tiny little muscles that surround every follicle of hair that a person has on their body. And the only places that humans do not have hair is on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, okay? So here they are when they're relaxed, and then when they contract, that is when you get basically a case of the goosebumps, okay? So anytime you've had a chill or, ooh, I'm afraid, and you've gotten the goosebumps, those are your erector pili muscles contracting, okay? So what happens when a person has their ATP supplies depleted is basically they're gonna get an all over case of the goosebumps, okay? Because rigor mortis is gonna start in these erector pili muscles and the hair is gonna stand straight up. And that's gonna happen all over the body, okay? So that's how we know the process is starting. And in a typical environment, okay? So think of like, you know, the temperature that you keep your house at or the temperature in a typical classroom, okay? Rigor mortis is gonna start developing about 30 minutes after death. So it's gonna start in the erector pili muscles, and then it's going to go to the jaw muscles, and then slowly work its way down the body. And finally, it's gonna spread out to the extremities, meaning your arms and your legs, okay? So the last parts of your body that will go into rigor are your fingers and toes. And then as it starts to go away, the first place it will start to go away are also your fingers and toes. So it works its way out and then it stays fully set and then it starts to go away in the exact, you know, in the reverse order of how it formed. So for rigor mortis to be fully set, what we refer to as full rigor in a typical environment takes about 12 hours. Okay, that means that the, it, all of the muscles in that person's body are in full rigor. And if any of you um, work as paramedics or EMTs or a CNA um, or in police work, and if you've dealt with a person that is in full rigor, it is literally like that person is made of cement. Even the tiniest person, okay? So, I mean, I remember working with a decedent who was a 95 year old woman and she weighed about, I would say 80 pounds soaking wet. And literally we could not move her, okay? It was literally like lifting cement or a piece of wood. So when I say these muscles are stiff, they are stiff, okay? So in a typical ambient environment, it will be completely set. The person will be in full rigor starting at about 12 hours after death and then it lasts for another 12 hours, so 24 hours total, okay? So, you know, if, if 
as a death investigator, they encounter a person who is in full rigor. Um, they're going to say that this person has been deceased for approximately 12 to 24 hours. Then it starts to go away in that reversed order. Okay. So the fingers and the toes start becoming, you know, movable again. It will work its way up through the legs and the arms. And then finally, after 36 hours in a typical environment, rigor mortis will be completely gone, meaning the person's muscles are movable again. Okay. Right? So, um, in fact, the, the second death investigation video that I'm going to assign to you, um, the name of the video is Death Detectives. You're going to see a death investigator who has found a person and they can see that he's in full rigor, but you're going to see the investigator trying to move his fingers. And so what he's doing is trying to determine, okay, is he just coming into full rigor, which would put him at about the 12 hour mark or is this starting to go away, which would put him closer to the 36 hour mark. Okay, so fingers and the toes can be very, you know, can give you a lot of information in that. Now, remember, I mentioned ambient temperature. And like any biological process, rigor mortis is very dependent on conditions. So if there is a higher temperature, um, the person is going to go into rigor faster, okay? If the person died with a high fever, maybe their fever was 103 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 98.6, okay? That may cause rigor mortis to come on a little faster. Um, or if they die in a hotter environment, if someone collapses and dies in the middle of the desert where it's really hot, you're going to have a faster onset. When there are lower temperatures, you're going to have a slower onset. So if a person like, you know, we always see these tragic cases a couple of times in Iowa over the course of the year, a person either goes out ice fishing or maybe they're riding a snowmobile across a lake and the ice isn't fully set. You know, they fall into the, the lake and then they die, you know, from drowning and their body isn't recovered until the following spring or when things warm up. Theoretically, maybe that person didn't even start to go into rigor until they are found and then brought up to a higher temperature, okay? So if a person is at very low temperatures below freezing, it's really, really, really going to slow down rigor mortis, okay? So this is why it's important to understand and record the ambient conditions because it can have a huge impact on these processes and that can greatly affect the uh, time of death estimate. Okay, so now I'm gonna have you look at the first picture, okay? So this is gonna be slide 12. So slide 12 is from an old embalming textbook. Um, so this is something you probably wouldn't see today simply because of HIPAA violations, but back when this was published, um, things were a little different. Okay, so this is um, a photograph of a man who is in full rigor and you can see he's laying between two stools, okay? And um, according to the photograph, he had died approximately 18 hours before this photograph was taken. So he's within that 12 to 24 hour um, time span. So yeah, he, every muscle in his body would be really stiff at this point. The other thing that I wanna point out and this is why I wish I could show it to you because then I could use my cursor on the computer. But if you look at him, it looks like the posterior or the lower half of his body it has a darker tone or pigment than the upper part or the anterior part of his body. That's what I mean by the process of liver mortis, okay? So I just wanna point out that these processes all happen at the same time, and we'll get into that um, you know, process after rigor mortis, but I just wanna point out that. Okay, next photograph. So this can show you how rigor mortis can help with body positioning. And especially when you think about, huh, it, you know, was a crime committed? Was this body moved after the person died? So it can give a lot of clues as to scenarios that don't make sense, right? So in this photograph, you have a young female and it looks like she's laying, you know, next to a building. Um, but most of the time, if she were to have collapsed and died in that, 
you know, scenario next to a building, she's not going to be in a position where she puts her feet up on the side of the building and then looks like she's sitting in a chair, right? Her legs are going to be out flat if she collapsed where, you know, she was discovered. So what this tells investigators is that, hmm, she was likely in a sitting position when she died and was in that position for at least 12 hours because that's where rigor mortis became fully set. Okay, and sure enough, when they talked to, I think it's, you know, the boyfriend, basically they had an argument, you know, he killed her and then panicked and then dumped her body thinking that no one would notice that she was in this position where it looks like, she, you know, she was seated with her knees bent. Okay, so rigor can tell you a lot about positioning and really when things don't make sense. Okay, so next photograph has four different photographs. So let's start at the upper left. So this is a person that's in full rigor again. Um, thankfully, they covered the face here, a little more respect in terms of you know HIPAA and keeping that person's identity a secret. But once again, laying between two sawhorses, um, completely rigid, and you can see how his hands um, are up. So that is a person in full rigor that would be in the 12 to 24 hour um, time frame. Okay, so to the right, the upper right and the lower right, those are the same person, okay? And actually, oh no, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm in error. Okay, so upper right, let's talk about that gentleman first. I thought they were the same, but they're not. So. According to the information about this photograph, this person died. He was laying on his couch, just watching TV. And according to the family, when he did that, his head would be on a pillow. And then he also liked to just like have a pillow laying on, on his stomach. And then he would put his hands up on the pillow. Um, just, you know, just a little comfort thing. We all have those little, you know, idiosyncrasies that we do. And he had a natural event and that's how he died. And no one discovered him because they thought, oh, he's just sleeping on the couch for tonight. So that's how he went into full rigor. So his hands were actually laying on a pillow that was laying on his stomach, okay? So that was a natural death. Now, lower right. So I was kind of confused about this one. I had to go and look up the information. Um, so you'll notice the positioning of his arms. And one of the things I wanna draw your attention to are these injuries that are on his left forearm, okay? Where you see some bleeding there. So those to me, I wondered if this was a homicide simply because those to me look like what could be defensive in injuries. And we're gonna cover that in the next slide. Um, defensive injuries are basically injuries sustained when a person is trying to fight off an attack. And normally they are on the upper extremities. So this man could have been holding up um, his forearm if someone was trying to strike him with a knife or some other type of sharp force object, okay? However, when I read the background material for this particular case, this was actually a suicide with a shotgun. Okay, so he was holding on to the barrel of the shotgun and it was in his mouth and then he used his right hand, um, was on the trigger and he was able to pull the trigger. And this is a perfect case of where you need experienced death investigators because someone could have staged that scene, right? They could have shot him and then uh, put the shotgun in his hands, put his finger on the trigger and then just left him there. And so he went into rigor mortis in that position. So yeah, you need to be able to understand whether, you know, did that person, um, are they were they able to actually reach the trigger with their right hand? Were they even right-handed? Okay, also were they, did they have things going on in their life where they were considered suicidal? Were they having suicidal ideation? Did they have a long history of depression? So. If you don't have training in that, that's when things can be labeled as a suicide when it's actually a homicide or a suicide when it's actually an accident, things like that. The reason I didn't you know, guess suicide by shotgun is it doesn't look like this person has a lot of trauma 
to his head. Um, and normally when a person, you know, puts especially a shotgun in their mouth, there is significant trauma to the face and to the head. And I don't see that in this photo, but according to the information from this case, that's what he died of. Okay. So that was his positioning. So, oh, here we go. It's doing a weird thing again. All right, there we go. Okay. So the lower left photo. Now, when you look at this uh, decedent, so he went into rigor mortis laying on his left side, and then he was turned, um, flipped over by the paramedics at the scene. And you can see he's in full rigor, okay? He has a lot of blood around his left armpit. And what actually happened is he was um, shot and the bullet and uh, entered under, basically in his left armpit and then passed through the ventricles of the heart. And that's what caused him to die. Okay, so one thing I want to point out is if you look on his left calf, he has basically, um, you know, a cardiac strip. So you might wonder why, why would a paramedic put a cardiac strip, which will transmit, you know, the person's EKG to a hospital if they're in full rigor, okay? Because if a person is in full rigor mortis, they've been dead for at least 12 hours. And paramedics who we trust to restart our hearts and to give us life-saving medication. And, you know, I think they're qualified to state when a person is deceased or not. I'm, I'm pretty sure I would trust them to do that if I trust them to save my life. However, this is interesting, okay? So every ambulance service is its own independent contractor and it has a medical director and there are some ambulance companies that will not allow their emts or paramedics to declare a person deceased and what they have to do then is put an ekg strip on send it to the nearest emergency room and a physician has to look at it and say yep that's a flat line that person's dead okay you can say that they're dead and that's why they did that to this particular person, because I guarantee they knew he was deceased, but unfortunately um, they're not given the power to, de to declare the time of death, which I think is ridiculous. So um, anyway, that is an example of that. So I had mentioned defensive injuries. Okay, and let's see. Okay, so this one actually comes up. So defensive injuries are injuries on the victim that are sustained when someone is fighting off an attack or they're defending themselves. So really, I mean, it could be found in a person too who has to, you know, the, uh, the, the person attacking them was killed due to self-defense, okay? And it would be considered a non-criminal homicide. That can happen as well. So this is an example they sh that, you know, the people recreating the photographs are showing common places where defensive injuries can be found. So if it's a sharp force injury, they're often seen on the forearm. They can be seen between the webbing of the thumb and the forefinger on the palm of the hand, which, you know, sounds awful. Like, why would you grab the blade of a knife? It's going to cut you, right? But if you're being attacked and you're fighting for your life, you're not even going to think about that. You're going to do whatever you can to get that webbing weapon away from hitting a vital part of your body, meaning your neck or your heart, okay? So these are often seen. They can be seen in beatings. Um, they can also be seen in gunshot wounds. We, you know, if someone puts up their hand, even as a reflex to ward off a bullet, which is, you know, the flesh of your hand is not going to stop that, but you can see bullet holes that occur, you know, through the person's hand before it enters their body. And that would be a defensive injury. So this is something that, you know, especially when a forensic autopsy is done, they're, they're definitely going to go over the body and look for defensive injuries. Okay, so one of the things I want to mention too is a very specific narrow type of rigor mortis. And, you know, if you go into law enforcement or, you know, death investigation, you may never see it. I've only seen it once in my career. Um, and it's basically instantaneous rigor mortis. And it's when it usually occurs in gunshot wounds to the head. And it's literally that the bullet has to cross a certain pathway across the brain and it has to disrupt certain neurons for it to happen. So it does not happen in every, um, you know, gunshot wound to the head. It's, it's pretty rare. 
Okay, so it can also happen whenever a death is preceded, and this is a medical term, okay? It's not great excitement like, ooh, I'm excited, something awesome is happening. It basically means that something neurologically traumatic is happening, like a seizure, okay? Or something, it could happen, you know, I would imagine too, in asphyxiation, where the you have hypoxia, where the brain is deprived of oxygen, and so the body is scrambling to do anything it can to get oxygen, okay? So it can happen, but like I said, it's pretty rare. It can also be when a person has a seizure right before the time of death, okay? So that can happen in cases of epilepsy, but that can also happen when a person suffers um, a poisoning, like in carbon monoxide deaths. Um, it can also happen in uh, deaths where someone is drowning. So yeah, that's not that uncommon to have a seizure, but it doesn't always mean you're gonna end up with this. But I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. The important thing is that it doesn't follow the typical time frames normal, of normal rigor mortis. So it literally happens instantaneously okay at the time when the person dies when they have that event where it's either the gunshot you know the bullet crossing those certain neural pathways or a really bad seizure um and it happens right at the time of death which we refer to as you know perimortem okay postmortem means after death um and it also doesn't go away so it forms immediately and then it just stays there until the body gets so decomposed that the muscles basically break down, okay? And it's normally found in the hands also, okay? But it's not gonna follow those typical time frames of 12 to 24 to 36 hours, okay? So now I'm gonna refer you to your next picture. So this was a Chicago case, and this was a gentleman who died by a gunshot wound to the head um, not a shotgun, but a handgun. And he was a Caucasian person, but you'll notice in the photograph, he is, you know, his hand is kind of blackish, brownish green. That's what decomposition looks like, okay? So we will get to that. Um, and that happens to everyone. Everyone who goes through decomposition basically turns those colors, okay? But if he's in full decomposition, which means well after 36 hours, he should no longer be in rigor mortis. But what, what was discovered um, by the police officers who removed the body was that his hand was quite, uh, tightly clenched to that firearm and you know there was no letting go of it. Now, once they got him to the medical examiner's office, they had to basically break the bones of the hand to remove that firearm because you're not going to bring a loaded firearm um, into you know the medical examiner's office and you want to preserve that evidence but that's what cadaveric spasm is it's just instantaneous and then it it's not going to go away okay so that was an example of that here is another example so this was in a case of drowning okay so one thing that I, I don't want you that I, I want to make this clear. Okay. When this happens to this person, they are for all intents and purposes already deceased. Okay. I don't want you to think that this was a person that was, you know, suffering because they're grasping at the bottom of the lake or wherever, you know, and that's how they got this vegetation in their hand because they were struggling to breathe and they were panicking and they were still conscious. No, when cadaveric spasm happens, it is a neural reflex. And with a lot of people who drown, the body sinks first. And when, you know, and if they have a seizure right before they die, if their hand happens to be near some vegetation that's on the bottom, yeah, they can end up with that in their hand and their hand stays tightly clutched like this. Okay, so this person was not conscious. The You know, the human body is very good at anesthetizing itself when it is near the point of death. So this person did not feel anything when this happened. They were basically, you know, deceased at this point. It was just a neurological reflex. But that is another example of where this happened. So when this person was discovered, yep, they had all of this debris in their hands because their hand is tightly clutched due to cadaveric spasm. 
And let me see if there's anything. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Ooh, this is kind of lengthy, sorry about that. But the next video, um, we should finish up PowerPoint number two because we will be talking about liver mortis and then algor mortis, okay? Thank you.